Okay, welcome to Applied Learning Theory. This is the first lecture in the series. Uh, I'm going to go a little quick through this one because most of this is a pretty much a dead on repeat of what you've already read in your textbook. So um, let's just get going forward with this and uh, hope everything works out well. Maybe. There we go. Alright, science. Nice, pretty picture of science. Not that it is science, but anyway, it's more like art, but. I don't know, it's a cute picture. So, there you go. What is it? Uh, <coughs> science is huge, right? Uh, it's a, <coughs> excuse me, it's an extremely broad term. It can be defined in all sorts of ways, but basically it's the process of doing something, right? So it's an activity, right? I think of science as more of a verb than anything. Um, so it's a process of doing something to discover information about the world, right? And it says, as I tend to talk about a lot, uh, science is self-corrective. It's the only, it's the only way of knowing that actually tends to correct itself. Um, if something is wrong from a scientific perspective, it will be found out, and it will be uh, repeat. It, it will, it will be fixed, right? So because then the next study down the road will, it will challenge the original findings, uh, and or replace them, and or supplement them, or whatever it may be. So science is a self-corrective procedure for uh, finding out information about our world. What's the purpose? Right? Well, pretty straightforward. You got a couple of different purposes. Description. Let's describe these phenomena in 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 general. Right? Whatever those phenomena are that we're looking at. Let's predict these phenomena. When are they going to happen? How are they going to happen? Under what conditions are they going to happen? And can we control these phenomena? Is it going to happen? And when is it going to happen? It's tied in directly with with prediction. Uh, but of course, we we need to know if this is something we can control. When you put all three of these things together, basically, then we have an explanation for the phenomenon in question. Right? Um, one of the things that I, I will talk about throughout this course and what this course focuses on is the difference between cause and functional relation. So, <coughs> functional relation in itself, uh, you know, on the surface, functional relation means cause. Right? Uh, we don't talk about causes in, in our science for a, a very specific reason, and that, that's simple. It's that we can't observe all possible instances of something. So we can't rule out every single variable that exists in the world. Why not? Uh, because there's too many to, to rule out. So I, I can't actually say that something causes something else. I can say that something is functionally related to something. Right? So does caffeine cause you to be excited? Does it uh, fire you up? Well, I can't really say that. What I can say is that consuming caffeine is functionally related to you having more energy. Right? It's the same sort of thing, but it's a more technically accurate way of explaining cause and or talking about cause and effect. So uh, in this course you'll hear me talk a lot about functional relations and we'll even talk about functional definitions and FBAs and all sorts of stuff. But the basic idea is what is the function of this phenomenon? How is it related to other events? Right? Uh, so <coughs> if this person is excitable or if they have a lot of energy that could be functionally related to the fact that they've consumed caffeine or a whole bunch of vitamin B. I don't know. You know so you get the idea here. The scientific attitude. <clears throat> All right, we got a couple of things to deal with here, and this these can be a bit of a challenge. But uh, first off, the scientific attitude means that we take a deterministic approach. This challenges a lot of people's views of human behavior and behavior in question. Deterministic does not mean predetermined. Two different things. People often get them confused. So predeterminism or predeterministic approaches are ones where your destiny is laid out in front of you and that you just follow the path that already exists. That's not scientific. Scientists reject that sort of notion uh, on multiple levels. Deterministic means that your behavior is caused by something. Physics is deterministic. Psychology is deterministic for the most part, not completely, and it depends on what uh, fields, you're, what, what parts of psychology you're in. Um, but behavior analysis, for sure, is a purely deterministic perspective. Right? So we can talk about strict determinism versus what we what we tend to accept as determinism now. But strict determinism is a really sort of uh, what do you call it? A, uh, a harsh view 
of the world. And I don't mean that in a bad way. It's just, it's harsh. And uh, like the picture shows here, strict determinism is event A causes event B, which causes event, or is functionally, re functionally related. So A then relates to B, which relates to C, which relates to D, which causes you to pour yourself a cup of coffee this morning. Um, so there's all, all these cogs are in, interacting with each other and they are um, they're all these links in a chain if you will and there's nothing broken in there so that's a strict deterministic perspective um, of behavior where it, there's one event in the world that happens and then it leads to another event which leads to another which leads to another which leads to another and keep in mind these types of events don't have to be all behavioral so something could happen in the environment there could be noise outside like like just a moment ago before I started recording lecture um, there was noise outside my window right? so that was one event and then so I got up and I closed the window and uh, it didn't shut all the way with so that not shutting all the way led me to adjust the handle so I adjusted the handle which led me to try again to close the window and then that led me to then latch the handle after I was done so you can see all those events linked directly to each other that's a strict deterministic view um, there are other views, right? And some of them are it's, it's not so strict anymore. And what we're starting to find out is that uh, determinism is definitely the case. You know, behavior is definitely determined, but it may be that there's gaps, okay? and those gaps may exist for days, weeks, months, years. Right? So something that happened when you were six may actually affect behavior when you're thirty. Okay? It's entirely possible that that happens, but. It, that's hard to measure scientifically, right? We, we can't really do that in a lab, uh, just because it's too there's there's too much of a gap, and we can't raise people in labs yet. Uh, but uh, you never know, you know, uh, you know what causes something. But uh, from a scientific perspective, we have to take this deterministic approach. And and the reason that we have to take that is that if we don't, if we don't take a, a deterministic approach, then we're basically saying that behavior is up to whatever. And, well, you know, since it's up to whatever, there's no point in trying to find out what causes it, because anything could cause it, especially stuff that's completely unobservable. So, gosh, you know, why even bother? Why have a science? So if you don't take that the deterministic perspective, there's nothing to study. Um, if you believe that behavior is caused by some inner uh, magical thing, uh, when we'll rename that magical thing later on, but then... Ultimately, what's going to happen is is that you're going to have nowhere to go with it. You're going to have nothing to research because something that's magical and made up can't make something that is real, right? And that is something that's a, that's a challenge for science to deal with, and in all sciences, not just psychology, but uh, it's something that we have to deal with. And so we take this deterministic approach, and that makes us feel a little bit machine-like, you know. And that's kind of for some people that that's not comforting. For others, it's great. It's like, oh, cool, I can finally explain my world. Empirical, I'm assuming you already know what this is. And empiricism is just um, being able to observe something, right? So um, our, our scientific attitude is that we're going to be focusing on things that we can observe. So unobservables are out. Um, in this class, if you start saying things like, well, I decided to do that, well, deciding is, is unobservable. Um, if you talk about mind, well, that's an unobservable event. Um, if you talk about uh, any metaphysical phenomenon, those are unobser unobservable events. So there's all sorts of stuff that don't cut it uh, for a true science. And psychology has gone down this path of going away from empiricism, uh, back and forth, and it kind of bounces back and forth. But it's gone away from empiricism for a while, and it, um, in my personal opinion, that's caused some damage to our science as a whole. So we're experimental. We do research, right? We try to control for things. We control for variables and... Uh, manipulate others and try to determine what's really going on with our behavior and with, with within our world. Okay? And we do th do so through experimentation, high, highly controlled experiments. Those of you that have had me before know all about all the types of experiments that we can do. Falsification. Uh, <coughs> basically what we're after with falsification is that uh, this is the Karl Popper's approach to, to science and that that's still the view is still held. This is an early 1900s change uh, to how science was done, and historically it was done different. It, it was done from a logical positivism perspective, but now we use this falsification approach. And a falsification approach is one in which we seek to show what is not the case. In other words, we try to uh, prove something wrong. Because if you continually try to prove something wrong, but uh, and it has the potential to be proven wrong, that's the other key here. Uh, <clears throat> then, then you fail. So if there's something out there, so some phenomenon out there uh, that has the potential to be proven wrong, but you fail at it, uh, then that strengthens that phenomenon, or that 
that explanation. For example, let's look at uh, what, what's his name Einstein stuff. The, uh, the theory of simple relativity that that simple relativity uh, is falsifiable. It's possible that you could prove it wrong. However, uh, no one's done so yet. So and it's been around for quite a while, and people are still trying to prove it wrong. So that means it's a pretty strong uh, what do you call it the, the the pretty strong observation or theory or whatever you want to however you want to define that and. Uh, it's withstood attempts at falsification. So that's what makes it stronger. So something that can't be falsified, though, is out the window. So in other words, so something that has hypothetical constructs in it, that, that's garbage. It's completely useless. It, it serves no purpose in science. You know, Freud, for example, uh, his theories were completely non-falsifiable, mean, meaning they were non-testable. You couldn't actually test his theories. So as a result, scientifically speaking, they're not worth anything. They're worth less than nothing. They're just a distraction from reality, uh, and that's a problem. Okay, so uh, in our field in behavior analysis, we, we're not going to use any hypothetical constructs, and we're always going to talk about falsification uh, as a method for our science. Heavily built on replication. There's no question that that our field is um, extremely reliant upon replication, and that's simply because of the fact that we have so much information to uncover and we have to do all these small little studies and our single subject approach that we use makes it difficult um, to do quality science uh, without replication. So replication is the key and replication is pretty much the key to any science but it really it really applies here and we've already talked a little bit in the past about a couple of different types of replication, systematic and direct, and both those apply in, in, this, in this scenario. And parsimonious, you know, so the scientific attitude is somebody that it takes a parsimonious view uh, of the world, so uh, two events uh, describe or uh, two uh, explanations for the same event. The more simple one is usually correct, not always, but usually correct. And uh, so, uh, you know, parsimony is a bit overrated, but uh, it's still a, a guiding principle that we, that we like to use. Uh, <coughs> and it's falsified, you know, assuming that whatever you're you're choosing uh, is falsifiable, then it's completely harmless to choose the most simple explanation because down the road you may falsify it because, as I've said, science is self-corrected. So start with the simple, and if it's more complex than what it, we initially thought, then that's okay, and we can just move on and you know, discover those new complexities. All right, let's look at a little bit of the history here. We have behaviorism. All right. So behaviorism was originally <coughs> uh, Watson, and we'll talk about that in a second. And so you hear behaviorism out there today. People are kind of misapplying the term because there are no Watsonian behaviorists around anymore. They're all dead, thank God. Uh, because they really took too simple of a view of behavior. In other words, they were overly parsimonious. Their results didn't quite fit the um, fit the data either. But that's okay. I mean, they, they did well. So today, when somebody talks about behaviorism, they're really talking about two fields, either EAB or ABA. So EAB is experimental analysis of behavior. Uh, that's the people that uh, live and work in universities and uh, run rats and pigeons and ducks and mice and geese and fish and birds and whatever else, right? Um, <coughs> and we do research on animals. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and that's the EAB stuff. It's as a field by itself. It's not dead, but it is definitely changing. So people that uh, there used to be a lot of jobs available in EAB, but nowadays uh, there's not as many jobs available in pure EAB. So you need to combine that EAB with something like uh, pharmacology or. Uh, biology or something else, and, and that's where that field is, is kind of moving towards. In fact, I, I, I tend to argue that EAB is kind of a, an unbelievable success story in science, and because uh, this EAB approach started, of course, with Skinner, and it started a little before that, but Skinner really kind of formalized it, and uh, so Skinner moves forward, formalizes EAB. We learn a ton over the next 50 years about behavior by studying rats and pigeons and mice and fish and whatever, right? Uh, <clears throat> Well, we've learned so much about behavior that we've kind of exhausted most of the questions, and, uh, at, at least with uh, uh, at that experimental level. And there's there's more there's more questions, but they're usually applied questions and how things interact and stuff. And there's still a few things, genetically speaking, that we haven't completely solved yet. But uh, in a nutshell, we've we've really done a lot of things. So as a result, the science had to grow, you know, and it had to change. And what did it change into? Well. Um, and any true science, right, should find out how it links up with other sciences. So EAB did, did, did just that. Psychology, you know, the study of psychology or behaviorism, if you will, um, you're studying behavior, right? Well, behavior is not independent of the organism that behaves. It is, you know, that, that, that 
an organism that behaves is what we're after. That's what we're interested in. Well, what's an organism? It's a biological entity. So to link a behaviorism with biology is, is just perfect. I mean, that's a natural um, sort of connection that exists between um, two scientific fields. And uh, of course, biology and chemistry go together, and chemistry and physics go together, and physics and math. And, and you can back that whole chain up if you will. But um, you get the idea that the EAB is kind of moving off into this other area with EAB plus pharmacology or EAB plus biology or EAB plus something else. So. ABA, though, is alive and well and will be for a very long time. It is an absolute thriving area, and there is a huge amounts of uh, there's a huge number of jobs available. There's quite a few graduate programs in the U.S. in this, um, even some international ones as well. So it, it applied behavior analysis, by the way, founded in 1968, as you guys have read. So uh, our goal is to take, in a nutshell, is to take uh, the, the procedures, uh, the behavior analytic procedures that we've discovered through scientific processes and apply them to real-world problems, applied behavior analysis. Go back our little history a little bit. Stimulus response psychology, that was Watson stuff. Uh, that was pure um, classical conditioning. That's what Watson was really saying. Did they, you know, explained all behavior. He was flat out wrong. SR psychology, stimulus response psychology, explains some behavior, but definitely not all. Uh, and then along comes Skinner with his EAB, right? Um, so when Skinner uh, comes along with the EAB, he shows that it's not stimulus response psychology it's, it's something else and it's it, it's more thought of as um, stimulus response stimulus psychology or a three-term contingency so Skinner basically discovered um, that it wasn't just two terms uh, that explain behavior a stimulus and a response that there was more to it than that and in that third term uh, really does capture all sorts of stuff and later on we've actually had fourth uh, a fourth term under some conditions and sometimes even five and those are still empirically supported and we'll talk about those when we, when we get to that point in the lectures so Skinner really formulated this EAB stuff, and of course EAB uh, then in 1968 branched out, it formally branched out in 1968 into ABA, right? Um, so, but ABA grew directly out of the research that came out of the labs with the rats and pigeons, the applications that Skinner, or the procedures that Skinner developed along with dozens of other researchers out there um, then uh, were applied to humans in an applied setting, and that's what we have today, which is ABA. A little bit more history here. Radical behaviorism is the field that we're that we uh, that, that's a philosophy that we operate under, which is uh, radical meaning different than, uh, not extreme. Okay, so radical is just means different. So different behaviorism. So it's not Watsonian behavior behaviorism. It's radical behaviorism, and the founding father of our intellectual area here is called it is Skinner, right? B. F. Skinner. Uh, it's made some changes over the years. Radical behaviorism has been modified a little bit here and there, but at the core it's extremely empirical and deterministic and, and extremely scientific. That That's the key with it. Um, so some of the things that we need to deal with here um, are like mentalism. Okay, Mentalism. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's out. Okay, We're not going to touch mentalism. Why? Because it's not scientific. Right? If we can't observe it, we can't measure it. If we can't measure it, we can't talk about it as something that controls something else, right? So we need to be able to get this control, right? So <clears throat> any hypothetical constructs are gone. Mind, it's out. We're not going, it's not an explanatory event. If anything, mind is the product of the bio, biological entity called the brain. Right? And let me turn that phone off, bear with me. Um, so mind is the biological entity. Or, or, so I'll try that again. Mind is not a biological entity. Um, <clears throat> brain is the biological entity. In fact, uh, Dr. Francis McSweeney once explained it to me, and the, the best way I think I've ever heard was, mind is what brain does. Mind is not a thing separately, right? which that's a challenge for our perspective in the world, right? Because since Descartes, since the 1400s, 1500s, whenever Descartes was around, um, he he argued for mind body separation, right? He argued Cartesian dualism. There's a mind, a separation between mind and body, and they're two different things, and they can influence each other, but they're, they're but they're really separate. And that's what that's what separated us from the animal world is our our mind, right? That was Descartes' idea, and that idea is alive and well today. That's a majority of our society believes that. Um, however, there's not a lick of evidence to support it. Think about that for an instant. Hundreds of years, 
we've believed something. At least as a, on, on a superficial level, we believe that there's a separation between mind and body. You may have even heard that in some of your classes. But not anywhere along the line did anyone present to you any evidence that there is a thing called mind. The only evidence you have, to paraphrase a famous psychologist, is the pang of consciousness that exists. Right? So in other words, it sure feels like there's something different there. And of course, behavior analysts feel it too. We, we understand the consciousness thing. Right? But because it's a hypothetical and there's no direct evidence that it exists other than the fact that you can that you can feel this sort of thing in your head or you can hear yourself do the private events you know that type of thing whatever um, well that is that that means it can't be it means it can't cause something else it's not there we have no evidence for it, it so as a result it can't be a causal event right? and some people go well that just means your science is a bunch of crap then if you can't ex if you can't ex if you can't identify mind and all that stuff. Well, no, actually we've explained a lot more uh, behavior than any other area in psychology. Any other area in psychology without appealing to these sort of events. Is it always comfortable? Not necessarily, especially for some people, but for other people it's a completely freeing sort of approach and it really makes, it makes some clear sense. So um, radical behaviorists are not dualists, we are monists. We don't believe in a separation between mind and body. Why? Because there's no evidence for it. Um, what we do believe, we, we're on the bar biological side of things. Um, so we, there's the biological entity and one of those products that, uh, or behaviors, if you will, that the, the biological entity of a human does is you know produce this consciousness experience that we can track. Functionally, this stuff is explanatory fiction. All right? And I will not accept explanatory fiction in my life. I don't think it's I don't think it's useful, right? In my scientific life, anyway. Yeah, you know, things change when you get outside of the lab. But the idea is is that there's no there's no way to show that your decision caused you to do X. As a result, saying that you decided to do it is simply an explanatory fiction. Um, I can't measure it. I can't do anything with it. Then we can go back to what we talked about earlier. If we can't do any of that stuff, then it's not scientific. And then what the heck's the point? Let's just stop studying behavior altogether. Because if we're going to take this half-assed sort of mentalistic approach, then we're not really doing that science any justice, and we may just give up right now. Ah, sure, you'll keep your job forever, and you know you'll you'll always be um, chasing windmills, if you will. But uh, um, I just don't think that's an ethical thing to do. But that's just me. Private events. Some people by this point they're, they either stopped listening to the lecture or slammed your computer down a couple of times, and well. Uh, we'll get some of that back. <laughs> uh, thoughts, feelings, you know, self-statements, all that stuff. Uh, I notice I haven't said anything about those being um, unobservable. They are observable. The problem is they're only observable to you. Okay? So your thoughts are observable to yourself. Right? Your feelings are observable to yourself. Right? Uh, your private verbal statements are observable to yourself and only to yourself. So. That makes things a little difficult scientifically, but we know they happen. We know private events occur, and, and some people will level the argument that radical behaviorists don't believe in emotion. Well, first off, that's wrong. Emotion is a biological response, and right? we know that. Uh, it's a very simple sort of process. Uh, and consciousness is something that we definitely uh, deal with and uh, do not ignore and in fact we call any of those things that happen quote unquote inside your head which simply call them private events they are behavior that need to be explained in their own right can behavior cause other behavior sure there's no right reason why it couldn't look at some of the research behind uh, sports psychology and look at what happens when you do um, what do you call it uh, visualizing right? that's a private event I visualize myself doing a high jump or whatever and then I do better at it when I actually attempt it. Sure, there's nothing wrong with that. It's a private event. It's a private visual event. There's private verbal events. There's private, um, the, uh, you know, feelings and thoughts and those types of things. So you got all that stuff, right? Um, it's just private, so meaning that no one else can see it, which means it's a hard. It's hard to deal with scientifically because um, we have to trust your self-report. But that doesn't make it any less of a valuable of an area to work with. Um, and this is also part of the radical behaviorism. We actually deal with private events. Right? True behaviorism didn't. It <laughs> like, doesn't matter. It's completely irrelevant. Well, we don't think so. We think that there's definitely some relevance to it. All right. 
Applied behavior analysis. Oh, I know. It's cute. But ABA is not lab work. It's applied. Right? We use new methods. Right? Relatively new. Gosh, they're 50 years old now. Right? Um, we do not have a reliance on large groups like other parts of psychology. And, um, we can talk about why. I'm not going to get into it here. But uh, long story short, that large group approach basically uh, loses a lot of information and it does not lead to the prediction of behavior of an individual. It leads to prediction of behavior at the, at the group level. And uh, I'm not interested in, we as behavior analysts are not interested in uh, what the average behavior is of a person. We want to know what the behavior, that we want to know how to control your behavior. How can I get you to study? How can you get this student to not be tardy anymore? Those types of things. It was a new scholarly work. 1968 was when it was founded, Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis. Right? Um, so that's when the field was born. It existed before that, but not formalized. Right? Also in 1968, graduate programs began. So that's when this whole thing really got going. So in other words, a science in itself was born in 1968. Right? Um, did it exist before that? Yeah, the ideas, the applications of this. I mean, you can start looking at some of Skinner's writings and go back 30 years before um, the Jabba was founded, and you can see that he was using his... Uh, information about behavior to influence behavior of others, right? So in other words, he was doing applied behavior analysis work, um, solving social problems using uh, the research that he found in EAB, from, uh, from EAB, um, to, uh, to, uh, to solve issues in the world. So that's applied behavior analysis, All right? Traits were applied. In other words, we look for the improvement in behavior. We're going to do work that improves someone's behavior. They're functioning in the environment, society as a whole, organizations. There's an entire field called the OBM, Organizational Behavior Management, which is basically ABA for organizations. Right? And we can go into that and talk about that later on the side. Note. We're behavioral. Okay? The behavior is the question. That's that's what we're well, excuse me that's what we're after we want to know about the behavior what behaviors are we interested in because if we put things in terms of a behavior we can deal with it we can work with it we can shape it we can punish it we can reinforce it we can extinguish it we can do all sorts of stuff in other words the behavior in question it's of a behavior not about a behavior we're not going to describe we're not, not going to talk about the behavior we're going to talk about of a behavior it's it's we're going to we're going to work with it okay? um, we're not just going to talk about it so to speak <coughs> Everything's measurable. We're going to have operational and functional definitions. Right? Who changed? If it, it, if our techniques worked, right, then great. If uh, it, if our observer changed, and it wasn't the client, then we got a serious problem, right? So the basic idea is that when we're behavioral, we're going to watch everything. We're not just going to watch the individual that we're trying to treat. We're going to watch ourselves because um, we may be changing as well. In other words, we're going to study everybody that we can analytical. Okay? We're going to be looking for functional relations. Right? We're going to be looking for to be able to control behavior. We do that by establishing a functional relation and then once we establish a functional relation between the environmental events or even private events and a behavior then we can start to control that behavior. We can add or remove things from the environment, add or remove thoughts, that type of stuff, and then we can um, control the behavior. In other words we're going to look at the occurrence and non-occurrence of behavior and try to get stuff to con that to be controlled. Uh, being analytical leads to believability, right? So if if our findings are believable, then and, and if our procedures are believable, and if our methods are uh, believable, uh, then it tends to make more sense, and it tends to get adopted, and it tends to get used. Uh, you know, like I could use that example about uh, you know, if you're anxious, then brush your teeth, right? That doesn't sound very believable, and in reality, it is. You should believe it. It's, there's some good evidence for it, but it doesn't sound very believable. But uh, behavior analysis, on the other hand, it tends to make sense. It's very believable on the surface. And uh, some people reject it because of the simplicity of it. But that's not a reason to reject something. We make database decisions. Right? So when, if we're trying to look for a treatment for autism or something like that, we don't just create our own. We go to the literature and see what's been done in the past. Maybe it needs to be tweaked. That's OK. But we always start with that data. And to quote Don Baer, we are not theorizing about how behavior can work. We are describing systematically how it has worked. In other words, no armchair theorizing. This is based on evidence. It's based on direct observation. It's based on science. 
and that's what we're, that that's kind of our guiding principles, right? We have to be within that context. In a sense, that's limiting sometimes, but it's been extremely successful for the, the, the field itself has been extremely successful because we have taken a strict scientific approach. A lot of other areas in psychology do not take a strict scientific approach, and I would argue that they're not nearly as successful. Science, when done properly, it produces success and understanding about our world. If done Im improperly, it just obfuscates and confuses. And I'll let you draw conclusions about where I think psychology is as a whole. We are technological. Every one of our procedures are defined in extreme detail okay, and then replicated to make sure that they work. So the technology of behavior analysis is out there. Right? And it is, a, it is a technology. So let's look at this little flow chart sort of thing there. Um, so the subject is going to make a response, which leads to a manager's response. Um, then subjects make alternate response, manager's response, blah, 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 behavior under control, blah, blah, blah. All the arrows going everywhere. Let me explain it a little further. Initial problem, so the behavior in question, so whatever that is, so um, that's the subject response. So the manager is then going to respond, design a program to respond to that. Right? So all operative procedures are defined in detail, so we're going to define that program, we're going to implement it. Right? Then the next thing that happens is the potential problems, which is that the subject may make an alternate response if I implement this particular procedure, so how am I going to deal with that? So it's entirely possible that the subject does not make that alternate response, that the behavior just jumps, uh, so that, w that when, the, when the behavior manager implements their procedures, the behavior ends up under control. Or maybe the subject makes an alternate response, attempts a little counter control or something like that, and the manager's response, um, then we need a new one, and we need it defined ahead of time. Okay. How are you going to deal with the situation if it arises? Boom, there we go. Basically, we just make a bunch of flowcharts. So if we're trying to deal with a uh, deal with a behavior at an organization or something, an individual at an organization, we say, okay, here's their problem behavior. What can we do to get it under control? How might they react to that? Uh, how would we react to that? And so on and so forth. So what options do they, will they take? And we just kind of check things off down the list. And as we check things off down the list, we end up with uh, the, the behavior under control. The traits are conceptually systematic. The system works together. It's not separate. Everything interacts with itself. The science builds on itself. As we learn more, we add new techniques. Right? Um, the system doesn't contradict itself. Effective practices are always linked to basic principles. Basic principles are the stuff that came out of the EAB. And then we start to generalize responses. Right? So we may make procedures, well, we may use procedures that don't have a direct link to the basic. Uh, the, the basic science. Why? Because there may not have been a study done on computer use in rats, but we can generalize our technique, our technology, to that situation because we know that with rats working out a uh, in an operant chamber, um, that that has led to certain conclusions about behavior. We can then take those conclusions and apply them to somebody sitting and working at a computer. Okay. So we have that response generalization building up for us there. We've, we've, we've which leads us to being conceptually systematic. Everything is a nice tight package. We are effective. We are a-theoretical, believe it or not. There's not much theory involved in this. There's some philosophy, right? and that's the philosophy of radical behaviors. We're not really theoretical. Okay? We're empirical, okay? and we're functional. Okay? So somebody says, oh, that's reinforcement theory. Well. That is an accurate statement to some degree. There is some theory that's associated with reinforcement. In this class, we won't really be talking about it. Okay. There's other stuff that we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the function of reinforcement. How does it work? How does it not work? Right. Um, so in general, we're atheoretical. We don't have a theory that guides us. Why? Because we're not a deductive science. We're an inductive one. We build everything from the ground up. We only work on things that have clinical significance or social significance. And who determines that? It's not the researcher. It's those dealing with the behavior. So if you're in the field and you're having problems with a colleague, right, or maybe you're having problems with a student or a student's family or something like that, um, then those people, the other people out there, not you, those other people around you are the ones that decide whether or not there's a problem with the behavior. If there is a problem with the behavior, then they'll call you to fix it. 
But that's what behavior analysts, uh, that's, uh, and uh, you put all that together and it basically means we're effective. Generality. The treatments, we always shoot for them being long lasting in terms of time, in terms of settings. So long lasting in terms of time and then going across settings. Right? And any other behaviors that we're working with must be adaptive. In other words, we need to have we need to teach responses that are adaptive to the scenario. We need to teach adaptive responses in and to themselves. So I can teach you a set of skills that allows you to adjust to new environments. Right? Then I don't have to teach you about how to behave in a new environment every single time. I can teach you a core skill. It's like studying, right? that type of thing. Other aspects. We're accountable. Failure is expected and documented. And expected meaning we don't try to fail, but we know it will happen. And when it does, we will document it. There is no magic in what we're doing. The procedures are available. They're publicly announced. They're out there. There's nothing special. We are transparent. We know what we're doing. We'll tell you what we're doing. We'll show you what we're doing, and then we'll do it. We're pragmatic. We're going to only do what we need to do. We're optimistic. Okay? We believe that, everything, that our procedures are going to work. Okay? We're going to document improvement. And we're going to use behavioral tactics such as reinforcement, punishment, those types of things because they have been shown to be effective. An important part of this optimism is that unexpected success is documented. Right? Because sometimes you might not expect for somebody to respond to a particular reinforcer. Like there was an interesting study a while back about losing weight and they had different reinforcers and they were trying to figure out which was the most effective. And they paid some people and um, they gave them different things, and in one group they actually fined them. Uh, but their fine was interesting. The, the fine was cutting up money. Okay? So for every pound you lost, you had to bring your own dollar okay, um, into the lab, and you had to cut it up and throw it away. The group that was in the cut-up money condition lost the most weight. So in a sense, it's completely unexpected. That's not what you would have. Uh, that's not what we would have expected. <laughs> we would have expected that the positive reinforcement of giving people money for every pound they lost would would have been the most effective. But in reality, it was actually cutting up the money, which was the most effective. So kind of odd, but it worked. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Oh yes, why the frog? Go back a slide or two there, and you'll see a frog. There's a question as to why. I won't give you any more. Why the frog? All right. Anyway, definition of ABA. Here we go. Right out of your textbook. See if it pops up. Applied behavior analysis is the science in which tactics derived from the principles of behavior are applied systematically to improve socially significant behavior, and experimentation is used to identify the variables responsible for behavior change. All right, that's the end of this lecture. We'll move on and do another one.